So let's uh, go ahead and uh, get started. For the next 40 minutes or so, I'll be going through um, Mimosa's concept of a micropop and what it takes to uh, build design a micropop and some of the uh, products that support that as well as uh, some of the interesting um, uh, business examples of really how we get uh, a micropop um, going. So to get started with, um, Mimosa has a series of access solutions. Um, particular today, I'll be going over the micropop. But you know, if, if you look at um, Mimosa overall, we are the industry leading price performance when it comes to uh, access solutions. We provide solutions for rural, suburban, and urban. Uh, specifically, again, today we'll be talking about the suburban and urban getting into the uh, micropop. One of the key advantages that Mimosa brings to the table is uh, GPS sync that actually works. This allows spectrum saving, spectrum reuse, especially when you're getting into micropop architectures with lots of access points um, in, a, in a tight vicinity. We've got industry leading capacity, radios capable of multi-user MIMO to talk to multiple clients at a time. From a client device standpoint, we have reasonably priced clients under $100 that make the uh, deployability of micropops extremely um, uh, profitable. And we provide business grade products with consumer level affordability. A quick review of the solutions that uh, Mimosa has to offer. The first one is in rural areas. So um, we have products coming out shortly that will allow um, uh, access points on towers for long range, kind of your traditional WISP deployment. This is our A5C. Uh, it gives us some of the highest tower scalability um, in the industry in terms of user capacity, speed, and total throughput. For the suburban and urban, Mimosa has the A5 radios. These are designed for extremely short range micropops. Um, really, this is the uh, first of its kind wireless solution like that. And again, we'll be going into much more detail on that solution. A couple more solutions that Mimosa brings to the table. We have business grade, cost effective multi-client services. Uh, very shortly, we will have a uh, public beta out of our software that allows you to do point to multi-point on the B series. This has some very unique features that it brings to the table, such as supporting multiple clients that we call um, with backhaul grade quality. We have a unique two-channel technology that allows incredible reliability and helps handle interference for um, uh, business quality uh, links. We also have for enterprise access affordable fiber-like licensed solutions that transform basically unlit areas uh, into um, gigabit rings. So you can create uh, within an enterprise area gigabit rings for distributing um, high-speed bandwidth directly where it needs to be. But let's take a look at why we all came today. And really it's to talk about the micropop um, architecture that uh, Mimosa has designed with our A5 uh, unique quad sector um, access point. So if we take a look at the, the architecture itself, a micropop uh, is a unique way of looking at providing broadband access to subscribers. The whole design of a micropop is uh, taking an access point and essentially blending it into a suburban environment. Typically, your access point is going to be on a rooftop or a power or a phone pole. Um, the A5 provides a compact um, uh, you know, one gigabit solution with an access point. It's got a quad sector 360 degree coverage, so one AP can actually cover um, a, an entire circle uh, around where the AP deployed. And this is very important because when you're looking at a micropop, you know, this is not your traditional put an access point on a tower and cover a small pie-shaped segment. What we're doing here is we're putting the A5 uh, typically up on a rooftop um, inside a suburb and providing access all the way around it. So it's a 360 degree coverage. This is an important note of what makes a, a micropop um, a micropop is that it's, it's really covering the, the area around the access point. We've got GPS sync to help control self-interference. As we go through this, you'll realize that what we're talking about here is that we've got you know, fairly small um, circles around the access point that we'll be covering, right? So you're gonna be looking at you know, the A514, you know, we're, we're really recommending about 300 meters uh, away from the access point. The reason we're doing that is while the AP can go farther, uh, we want to design um, a system that is 
running at the highest MCS rates possible and also um, has enough signal to noise to overcome a lot of the traditional suburban interference that you'll get with the background noise. Typically the micropop is going to be backhaul or fiber fed. You'll probably have a um, you know, a, a second relay for the next micro pop. There's a, several different ways you can design the backhaul to this. We're, we're not going to get into that, but keep an eye on our blog post. We'll have some blog posts coming out about uh, backhaul designs. You know, typically the backhaul is either going to be five gigahertz or uh, another milli, some uh, millimeter wave radio that uh, gets the signal where it needs to go. Um, generally, when we look at product positioning A514, we're looking at for what I call the suburban landscape. It's a very small compact radio, if you haven't seen it up close in person, that fits and blends very nicely on top of rooftops and, and blends into the suburbs. For the A518, that product with a higher gain um, and a 4 degree down tilt is really designed for a high mounting solution when you're putting it high up on a tower, a very, very tall pole, or you're putting a single AP up on a hilltop. So it's um, uh, providing a, a different style of coverage in the A514. When we take a look at the, the clients of the Micropop, we've got you know sub $100, 500 megabits plus from a, a throughput standpoint. They've got a lot of different aiming options to build out in the neighborhood. We have J mounts and flexi mounts. You actually have a, a built-in mount right behind it if the, the angle is correct to go right, on, right onto a pole. And that's really what makes up the Micropop architecture. You know, when we look at distances again, we're looking really at designing um, small segments, uh, small uh, basically access point ranges, and I'll get into a little bit more detail on that. But that is what the Micropop itself is. Now, if we take a look at the business of a Micropop, you know, what, what really lends itself to being suitable for Micropop? And generally, it's designed where you have city areas with greater than 400 households per kilometer squared. It's kind of an a obtuse number for some folks, but if you think about a suburb where you've got housing developments, housing tracks, streets, and, and houses next to each other, that really is what the, the, the house, the 400 household per kilometer squared looks like. You know, we're also, if you look at demographics, where it becomes interesting is areas where copper speeds remain on ADSL for cost reasons. You know, you've got areas that just DSL lines are too slow. You have areas where fiber that cost, you know, northwards of 1K per household for the last 100 miles or last 100 meters just doesn't make sense, right? It's, it's not economical to put fiber in. And you also have areas where you have aging cable plants where the cable, cable providers ha have not kept their cable system up to speed. And what that lends is a, a very um, ripe demographic for putting in a micropop to go in and pr easily provide you know competitive speeds of 250 megabits plus. Um, you also have uh, in general this leads to the f the fact that you've got capacities that are just way too high for your tower based LTE type of solutions where you just you know there are too many subscribers in an area for a traditional um, you know tower based solution to work. Now if you look at the ROI from a Mimosa standpoint, this is very important because, you know, I think some of the initial comments we've heard is that, hey, this is, this is quite expensive. How does it actually make sense? But if you take a look at the overall capex required to build a micropop, you have either a 5 gigahertz or a millime millimeter wave backhaul radio. You're going to have an access point, an A5. You will typically have a, some kind of switch. Uh, backup battery system power supply, um, and, and all that in, including a C5 per house, ranges between $150 to $250 per household, depending on the type of backhaul you're going to use. So you can imagine at that type of cost uh, point, when you're selling competitive speeds of 250 megabits or more, you can get a payback tr typically in two to four months. So the ROI is actually very, very good. Um, to build a high capacity uh, micropop that provides extremely competitive throughput speeds. The, the micropop is also extremely fast to deploy and oftentimes that we've found, especially with some of our early customers that are deploying this, is that the deployments tend to go viral in neighborhoods where, especially when you have a neighborhood that is starving for bandwidth, you know, they're, they're used to getting one to two megabits per second. Somebody walks in and offers 100, 200 plus megabits the entire neighborhood hears about it pretty quickly and it really drives a very, very quick deployment model. 
So just a, a little bit of examination of what household density really looks like. You know, looking at the picture I have behind this screen is your typical suburban division, right? Subdivision, you know, where in this case you've got, um, you know, 353 homes in the highlighted area. And if you look at the typical densities that we see around the United States, for example, Austin is about um, 425, you know, uh, homes from a density standpoint. Places like San Antonio around 100 or 450. A town called Pleasanton, which is over by uh, our corporate office here, is over 1,000. Chicago, Denver, extremely high um, uh, households per kilometer squared in San Francisco at the highest. So you can see from a, a, a density standpoint where suburbia comes in, you know, a lot of these uh, major cities have uh, areas that are basically ripe for uh, micro pops. Another interesting business um, piece of a micro pop is really how you can open up opportunities and the conversations that um, I suggest you have with the community when you go to deploy this. As we've learned from some of our initial customer deployments is that, you know, when you design a micropop, often you're going inside a community and you're, you're deploying an A514 on top of somebody's roof uh, with another backhaul radio on it, often a, a B5 light or a millimeter wave radio. So, you know, it's, it's recommended that um, you get permission from the homeowners association or city councils before doing that. Uh, we've found some cities that actually have rules in place that have been designed to prevent what they call relay stations where you have a cell tower with the relay backhaul. And some of the rules for the cities are very nebulously written such that they blanketly don't allow uh, what they call a radio relay. So at, you know, when they, when they hear about um, a, a micropop architecture in the city council's minds, oftentimes they will think cell tower. They're thinking you, uh, people want to go put a huge cell tower on someone's roof which is not the case at all. I mean, if you look at a micropop and especially uh, an, an A514, you know, you can have a conversation with the city that says, look, here's what I'm, here's what I'm proposing to put on these rooftops. It's actually not a cell tower. It's, it's very small, it fits right in. And, and we've, had very, we've had success with some of our early customers that go out and have these conversations with the cities, they actually get approval to put this in so they don't have any issues as they start rolling the micropops out um, over an entire city. The same thing goes with homeowners associations. You know, there's a, a good conversation to be had, especially with large homeowner associations, to go in and say, here's the service I would like to provide. Here's the benefits that the, the people in your community will get. They'll get high-speed, reasonably priced internet. Oftentimes, if, if homeowner associations are pushing back, saying, no, I'm not going to allow this, you know, there, there could be some uh, services that could be offered, for example, saying, all right, I'm going to provide broadband access to paid subscribers in return for um, having access to put my equipment on rooftops and, and mounting rights, you know, there might be a, a give back where you say, in the park area, I will provide, you know, uh, use an A5 as an access point for just a hotspot for people walking by, right? So uh, same with cities as well, having that conversation saying, is there some service, wireless services we could provide you in exchange for us getting access to the mounting rights? Another interesting trend that we're starting to see is um, the FCC has basically relooked at their Lifeline program that was designed to provide phone access to the needy, and they're expanding that to now include broadband services to those in need. Um, and, and this is often a, an interesting discussion point to get into cities to discuss the homework gap. If you have parts of the community that don't have um, strong access or, or, or hardly any access to to broadband, kids don't have the ability to get their homework done because a lot of homework is being done online now. So you, so there's a, another interesting conversation to have with cities to be able to go in and be the provider that provides lifeline broadband services. There's actually subsidies, new subsidies being discussed from the FCC of how that program is going to work. So when we take a look at um, designing a micropop, you know, how do you actually make this work for your environment? We have a new micropop planner that uh, should be going live next month on our website. What the, what the Micropop Planner does, hopefully everybody's familiar with our backhaul link planner that we have. Um, what you'll do is, is go into the um, Micropop Planner site, uh, designate where you want the access points, what type, what type of speeds, services you're looking for, how many users per access point, and it will let you know what the coverage area will look like 
It will also help you design the backhaul for it. Um, so essentially what that gives you is AP location and ranges. In this case, here you're seeing about uh, you know 11 access points being, being used to design a coverage area for a neighborhood. And then the tool will have a bill of materials, basically a proposal generator that you'll click a button and it will show you what products are needed to make this work. So this will definitely help understand the, the, the reach of the access point, how far you can go with different ranges and, and different speeds. If we take a look at uh, geocapacity, this becomes extremely important. You know, if, if you think about the example I just showed where you've got 11 access points in a close vicinity to each other, using traditional um, you know, wireless channels, you get to a point where, especially running at uh, an 80 megahertz channel width, that you cannot, um, you, know, you basically get to the point where the access points step on each other in terms of channel planning. This is where um, uh, GPS Sync comes in. GPS Sync allows you to have network-wide channel reuse. So that way the radios are synchronized in their timing of when they transmit and when they receive. So they can effectively use um, all the same channels or for interference standpoints, you might have uh, you know, one or two channels being used. This is extremely important. Uh, along with this is uh, TDMA, which is a very high efficiency um, Mac layer that Mimosa has. So using GPS sync with TDMA allows um, very, very efficient use of the spectrum and very predictable use as you get higher client counts with higher throughput, you don't have the, um, you know, the, 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 the collision issue as you get more clients, there's more traffic on the network. With MU MIMO, we have the ability to do um, multi-client spectral reuse, so the access points can talk to multiple clients at once. So again, the ability to increase the throughput and capacity uh, in the MicroPOP. And then with the 4x4 design on the A5 access point, there's 1.5 gigs of throughput. So you truly have a, an extremely high capacity system to handle uh, the number of clients uh, that you're deploying around it. And really the, the number of clients depends on the density of, of coverage that you're looking at. For example, if you look at the picture behind uh, the slide here, you know, depending on how many subscribers that you expect to sell to, you know, you could be looking at 10, 20, 30, you know, we're recommending all the way up to 50, depending on the speed you're trying to do of clients per access point. And really that depends on how effective you think your sales goal will be. If you think you're able to sell broadband into 10%, 20%, 50% of the homes, that will dictate how many access points you have and, and basically how, how large the coverage area is for each access point. But geocapacity becomes extremely important to be able to have lots of access points um, in a suburban neighborhood. Another very important technical aspect um, of a micropop is being able to deal with the inherent residential noise that you're going to get. You know, in a suburban uh, neighborhood with lots of houses near each other, <clears throat> you know, you, you can expect to have other five gigahertz routers especially with IOT, you get you know, things like doorbells and thermostat controls. There's a lot of wireless that's out there. So in order, in order to have an effective five gigahertz solution, um, Mimosa has some unique technology that allows us to, to deal with this. The first is that what we're doing is we recommend when people deploy micropops is that we deploy short range designs, right? So you're always trying to design the A5 and C5 so they have the maximum link budget as possible and we're trying to keep the MCS rates at you know as close to MCS 9 which is the highest MC8 as, as possible. The reason this is important is that um, Mimosa has a technology called Advanced Auto Gain Controller AGC. Essentially this is like a wireless squelch. What it allows us to do is ignore signals that are below the level um, a certain level that we actually don't need when we're doing communications between the A5 and C5. So essentially, I like to think of this as wireless squelch. It allows us to squelch out the noise and then use that available bandwidth, um, assuming we have enough signal to noise ratio that we can uh, effectively communicate over the top of the interference. And this is why we've got, you know, for example, with an A514, you know, looking at about 300 meters out is the radius that we're, that we're recommending because at that radius we can effectively burn through a lot of the noise that's out there. The other benefit is that um, we've got uh, high immunity to some of the lower powered nearby indoor Wi-Fi 
and kind of what I would call self-plan interference. You know, the, the inherent nature of AGC allows us to avoid these sources of interference. It also allows us to avoid our own interference. One of the unique ways that this happens is with um, Mimosa's quad sector um, access point. What, if you take a look inside the, the tube of the A5, 14, and 18, what you'll see is a series of helices. And, and these essentially are the heart of our quad directional smart sector. What we do inside of the access point is that each panel, you can see here there's four panels, is essentially a sector or a stream. So our 4x4 four four has been designed so that there is a panel or stream in each direction. Um, when the access point is transmitting, it only transmits in the necessary direction. So we're not spewing energy like a traditional Omni um, everywhere. We're only sending the direction that it goes, that it needs to go. And then likewise, when we're receiving, um, we, we really isolate the receive noise to the listening direction because we know the direction that the, the C5s are talking to us. So it, it makes a, a very effective 360 de degree coverage without the negative impact that a traditional Omni would have of basically um, interference on all sides and interfering on all sides when you're talking. So this quad sector really is what makes the MicroPOP technology work. You know, looking at the products, we've got um, you know, the first and uh, kind of starting point is the access point. This is our A5 quad sector AP. It's 1.5 gigabits per second. We basically have two flavors. We have an A514, which is the one on the right. It's a very small access point. It's uh, 314 millimeters, so about a foot. Um, and it's designed for our short range solutions. And, and typically what we're finding um, is that the, the A514 is probably the most, uh, most appropriate access point for your traditional suburban deployment because it really blends inside. It blends in with the rooftop if you're putting them on, on, on the top of people's houses. You know, we're, from a, a range standpoint, you know, the range is always a, is, a, is, a, is a tough discussion point because you have the maximum range you could actually go and get something like MCS0. But what I would, I would rather have the conversation, what is the realistic range that you want to deploy to have a high quality, high throughput, and you know, interference resistant um, to background noise, which typically leads you to deploying this more at the 300 meter standpoint. Um, is term, in terms of uh, frequency, we support uh, 4.9 all the way up to 6.2 gigahertz. Um, in the current deployment models that we have, we have what's called Wi-Fi interoperability mode. Right now that supports the standard Wi-Fi channels. Uh, when the GPS sync software feature comes out later this year, we will, um, with that feature set, expand the range of the operation all the way up to 4.9 and 6.2. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that today. Um, these radios are IP67 rated, so they're um, you know, they do not allow water ingress inside of the radio, so they're safe to deploy um, out in the open environments. They all support GPS sync, and they have 4x4 um, 802.11 AC. The other product, which is on the left-hand side, is our A518. Uh, this is about a little over two feet tall. Um, it has a four-degree down tilt. This product really is designed for a higher you know, a high tower mounting option or a hilltop where you're looking at using the four degree down tilt and the higher gain to get uh, a larger coverage area um, than the uh, A514. One thing to note that when you're looking at, at, at how to deploy this is that with the down tilt um, on the A514, it's, it's designed to be deployed significantly higher than how the C5s are deployed. So um, keep an eye on our website. We'll be coming up with some blog po posts and technical papers that help, help you understand which product uh, is the best one to pick. The other interesting point that I'd like to point out with our A5 is that in addition to the 5 gigahertz uh, client radio, it also has a built-in 2.4 gigahertz local Wi-Fi radio, just like our B-series does. Um, this is designed for easy configuration and management. So if the product is mounted up on a tower, you don't have access to it, you can access the 2.4 radio for management. You can actually get into the radio, configure the radio, um, you know, get onto the internet. So it's, it's, it's been designed for easy management uh, and ease of deployment. Now taking a look at the subscriber client overview, 
here's a picture really of all the components uh, that make up the client side. One thing to note is that the way Mimosa sells its client radio is we basically sell it a la carte. So um, this is done to be extremely flexible depending on what the deployment needs are. So when a C5 is purchased, the C5 comes you know, with the, the radio, a um, little mounting clip, and, and a, uh, uh, basically a boot to provide um, a, a water tightness um, on the Ethernet port. And then for mounting options, power and ESD predictions, those are all sold separately because we feel that there's different options for everybody um, and, and we basically make it, make it selectable for what you'd like. So from a mounting standpoint, Mimosa has uh, two mounting options. We have the J-mount, which is your traditional um, uh, mount arm that uh, gets the C5 up uh, and off the roof. We also have a, a new mount that we've called the Flexi mount that is very, very compact, small, and extremely flexible. Hence, we call it the flexi mount. Uh, it allows you to mount it on a wall. It mounts you allowed it on a pole. It allows you to mount it actually vertical, horizontal. There's a lot of flexible ways. It's very low cost and uh, designed to be a, ex an, an extremely useful mount. From an ESD standpoint, Mimosa recommends that every installation has our gigabit NID. What the NID does is it provides an ESD protection. So you cable the C5 to the NID and then you uh, basically ground them, and this provides a basically ground outlet that takes the ground and keeps it basically out of the house. From a power standpoint, um, the NID also, by the way, has a door hatch on it that you can open up, and it provides uh, a service access as well. So if you need to get to the C5 and the subscriber is not home, you can open up the door and basically gain access if you need to do some remote troubleshooting. From a power standpoint, we have there's basically two options you can purchase from Mimosa for powering the C5. We have our G2 PoE gateway, and we have the Mimosa um, PoE injector. So those are both options, and again, we've designed those that you would, you know, when you purchase your C5, you, you pick the um, powering option that you'd like. It also, uh, it also works off of um, uh, passive PoE 48 volts as well. Taking a look at the C5, um, this is the client radio designed for short mid-range mid clients up to three kilometers. You could probably push it farther, but you know, once you get to that end, you're at MCS0, low throughput. Mimosa really recommends that we keep the deployments close together for extremely high SNR that gives us the ability to, to fight off the background residential interference. It's very compact, very lightweight. It's got uh, 500 plus megabits of throughput. Uh, it's got... Um, 20 dBi from an antenna standpoint, 24 dBm in terms of power. It's uh, designed, again, to be very lightweight. And again, it's, um, you know, the PoE and mount cho choices are sold separately. So make sure when you're purchasing this, you purchase those accordingly. So that's the client. We also have a, a, a new product that we've introduced called the G2. Um, this is our 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi PoE gateway. This is a great little compact, nice looking, clean product. It provides a um, simply integrated PoE plus great Wi-Fi. And really, it's designed to replace a lot of the um, you know, existing deployments today that have really a mess when you take a look at the powering solution where you've got PoE injectors, you've got a Wi-Fi router, and you kind of, you, you take your power strip, you plug all these devices into it, and you sort of leave a mess behind. The G2 allows you to have a very clean, simple, very professional installation left behind um, at, the, at the subscriber's site. You can add multiple G2s inside the house to expand the coverage. So if you've got the, the G2 in the office and somebody's got a larger house, you can put a second one in. You can wirelessly bridge them together, or you can connect them through structured wiring and uh, have the second G2 um, communicate um, over Ethernet. We've got cloud monitoring for in-home in Wi-Fi support, and we have a, a new feature coming out called Subscriber Network Health Monitoring, where the G2 itself monitors the availability of the network, the response times from the network name servers, and then reports that back to the cloud. So it gives you the ability to, to find out the health of the actual subscriber. And as well as, as well as the general health monitoring, we also have the ability to, um, from the cloud, see what's happening inside the house. So it eliminates a lot of the truck rolls when people call and complain that there's a problem in the house. You can actually go to the 
Mimosa Cloud and get down to the detail of what clients are connected to the G2, what their signal strength is, and it provides some very useful troubleshooting tools of the G2, the C5, the A5, all the way up um, through the broadband connection system. And it really makes a total integrated experience for this. Uh, so def definitely, I highly, highly recommend people take a look at the G2. You know, we, we're also seeing some customers look at the G2. If you don't want to use 2.4, maybe you might have another another service in the house doing uh, wireless, or you're just providing an Ethernet drop to the customer. The the G2 is a, a, a great basically termination point um, for in the home, and you add to that the network health monitoring, and it gives very, very good visibility into uh, what's happening in the subscriber. We spent a lot of effort at Mimosa to design a great Wi-Fi device. People often listen and say, "Add ah, 2.4 gigahertz, um, we're not going to use that. But we've actually gone through and taken a look at, at, at the very detailed level of how the radio operates, and we've put some features in that will allow the G2 to really shine when it comes to throughput and performance. The G2 automatically picks the cleanest channel on startup. It will also change channels when it detects interference that slows down the performance. And it has some interesting technology that we borrowed from our other radios to reduce the impact of noisy Wi-Fi neighbors with some very intelligent clear channel assessments. So the G2 can actually handle transmitting to its nearby clients even if there is other noise out there, which often isn't present on some of the low-cost, um, you know, cheap in-home 2.4. So definitely take a look at the G2. It's an important part of the solution, and um, it, it makes for a great uh, in-home Wi-Fi device. Now let's take a look at um, a, a very interesting use case of, of one of our first uh, deployments that was extremely successful. Um, it's a WISP called XL Broadband, and uh, what they've done is they've gone into the suburbs, uh, south of Chicago, and they are um, you know, delivering business and residential broadband using Mimosa products. They're using the Mimosa A5 series and the C5. Um, they've got overall uh, more than 750 customers. And then they're offering services in these areas um, that basically compete and are extremely faster than the existing incumbent DSL and cable providers. So this is a, a, a great showcase of how well the Mimosa products provide, but also the need that's out there in the suburbs of the, if you look at the Facebook post from the subscribers uh, that were there, they were really complaining about how bad their internet was. So along comes XL Broadband and offers um, internet services, broadband internet services with Mimosa products. And um, basically these are some of the, uh, some of the comments that people say, that, that, were, that were saying. So when uh, one customer had uh, XL broadband installed, you know, they're paying for 25 megabits, but woke up to this one day, said, I hope it stays this way. So here, here he's actually seeing uh, 300 megabits of download. And just to show you what his speed tests look like, you know, these are the type of results that people were getting. They're getting, um, uh, in this case, XL Broadband was actually running some tests doing um, services with wide open networks with no rate limits and then some with rate limits and kind of figuring out what was what was the best uh, best way to market and sell this. Well, here you can see when they're running wide open, they're getting you know 353 megabits of download, 325 megabits of upload. They're basically saturating the backhaul at this point. So the customers were extremely excited to see these type of speeds uh, in the environment, especially when they were coming from you know very very slow speeds around uh, you know two two to five megabits per second. So uh, Excel Broadband was able to make a a great business out of this. And you know I made a comment earlier where the deployments um, can can go viral, where when Excel Broadband was out installing. They did some door-to-door -door services, but at a certain point in time, the customers were so excited about the service they were getting, they were actually coming to stop the guy's trucks when XL Broadband would leave for the day. Neighbors would run out and, and you know, they wouldn't jump in front, but they'd basically wave down the truck and say, hey, can you get to my house? I really want your subscription. I hear the neighbors love it. You know, please put me on the list tomorrow. So it was sort of this viral um, spread of people wanting broadband. And if you just uh, take a look at a statement from um, Evan Galvin, the owner of XL Broadband, he basically said it transformed my network. You know, it was a new kind of risk, but Mimosa enabled me with fiber-like speeds to beat the local cable and DSL guys. And very true statement. So he's able to go in and, and offer extremely fast speeds. Anyways, that gets us to the end of the update today on uh, MicroPop architectures. 
wanted just to go over and make sure everybody understood you know, what the um, MicroPOP concept is, how it's different than your traditional um, access point on a tower with a sector, right? It, it really is designed to enable WISPs out there or, or any service wireless service, service provider to go into sub suburban communities and start providing extremely high capacity, high performance broadband services that are extremely competitive with existing incumbent DSL cable and uh, extremely fast to deploy.